Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I want to talk about the books I have read in the month of November. So I have a total of five, five books I, if I recall correctly I, I want to talk about. I have read some of these I've started in October and I just finished in November. And I'm going to start with the fiction ones because I think those are the ones you're kind of interested in. I don't know why I'm on such a non-fiction kick uh, lately, but it's still going strong. So I think it's going to last until the end of at least November. And then hopefully December is going to be more like a fiction, comfort read type of a month. I think I will definitely read more like comfort reads because since I can't go home for Christmas because of Corona, I think I will need to, to just read a lot of like cozy books. So the first book I want to talk about is The Foundling by Stacey Halls. I've seen this cover and this book mentioned a lot on booktube lately. It's actually a 2020 release so I was happy when I saw it at the library and then just picked it up. I really like historical fiction and I haven't read that much uh, this year. So I think this is also perfect for this time of the year because this is kind of a mystery. This one is about... Um, it's set in the late um, 18th century and it is about this young girl, a young woman living in London. She's very poor and she's a hawker so she's selling shrimps, going around the streets and, and, and trying to sell her shrimp and her father does that too. They're really really poor um, barely barely scraping by but she gets pregnant and then she gives birth to a daughter but she cannot raise the daughter so so she has to take this daughter to live uh, in this orphanage kind of called um, the foundling house I think that's what it's called uh, so basically she takes her to um, the foundling hospital and she's saying that uh, she's gonna leave her there and for some years but then she's gonna take her home she's gonna raise the money to pay back for her upkeep and then she's gonna take her home so she decides to go back and and six years after she goes back only to find that her daughter was apparently already picked up by her so we go on from there and we, we figure out what happened to the daughter and, and how her mother tries to get her daughter back and it's kind of a mystery and I would say from that point of view, it's not really well done as a mystery because you kind of, you're kind of being told uh, what happened afterwards. It's like, oh yeah, this is what happened. And there's not really the element of you trying to figure out being part of this mystery. And I think that's the biggest flaw of this book. Otherwise, I really liked how it, it, it talked about that era a late 18th century living in London as a poor. I think that's kind of like the this kind of like part of society you normally don't see uh, at the forefront of historical fiction novels. So I think from that point of view this was really well done. I will definitely pick up the author's previous book, The Familiars. Um and yeah, if you like historical fiction with kind of a mystery element to it, I think uh, you might enjoy this one as well. The next fiction book I read is a, is a debut novel and it is My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. I picked this up because I've seen it mentioned quite a few times on booktube and I was just curious about it. So I didn't really know anything about it going in and oh my god what a ride this was. It's such a dif it, it's such a difficult one to read because it, it it is about this young girl, 15 year old girl, who gets involved with a teacher who is 42 years old. And then um, it, it is about their relationship throughout the years until, until this girl is like 30, 30 years old. And how this relationship, this abusive relationship really shapes her life and how it determines who she is as a grown-up and how she cannot move on, how she cannot shake that past because she also has a hard time acknowledging that what happened to her is, is, is not a romantic relationship but sexual abuse. She was groomed basically as a child and 
it is absolutely devastating but it's also kind of a hard one to read from the point of view of the main character because she doesn't want to be victimized and she doesn't see herself as a victim she is she's not she's an unlikable main character basically but you have to remember all the time that she's the victim here even though she doesn't know it even though she doesn't want to acknowledge it and the teacher and and the descriptions of really what happened also sexually between them is quite it's quite on the page basically this book is about how this young girl and and woman afterwards grapples with this trauma throughout her life and how she tries to move on and heal i guess so this book also has elements of what happens when someone tries to expose uh, this teacher or people or men who do this and how this is portrayed by society, how these girls are, are portrayed uh, by journalists. And it's just, it's just so powerful and it takes so much, it takes so much courage to come forward and lay yourself bare, I guess. So I gave this like four, four and a half stars and I highly recommend it if you are committed to read about such a heavy topic like this. And next, let's get to the three nonfiction books I read. Two of these I actually started last month. I just finished this month, but that doesn't, that doesn't matter. <laughs> so the first one um, I picked up is Requiem for the American Dream, The Ten Principles of Concentration of Wealth and Power by Noam Chomsky. And this is actually based on the movie um, Requiem for the American Dream. Actually, I think I've seen that or started watching that some time ago on Netflix. And it is about, it is like a short picture book, I would say really easy to read, really easy to digest and understand. So I think this is, was such a fascinating read because it's like such a, it's, such, it's so concise, short and to the point, but it's also very impactful in the way it's, it, it, it presents these 10 principles. So basically the 10, some of the 10 principles are um, reduce democracy, shape, I, Ide ideology, redesign the economy, shift the burden onto the poor and the middle classes, attack the solidarity of the people. And I really like how it, it starts with like what happened throughout history in the US and how the American society and politics itself was built, how the constitution was made and how it was basically made for the rich, for the people who govern the US. And how at some point in like the 60s, 50, after the 60s and 50s with all the movements for, for civil rights and the movements for women's liberation, how the, the wealthy kind of felt threatened because they felt like America was becoming too democratic. It's really interesting how consumerism comes into play in this and how the wealthy and the people ruling the US kind of tried to and succeeded into shifting the American population's focus onto consumerism so as to maybe shift away their thinking uh, and make them think more about themselves. So a very individualistic society who doesn't think about other people, which is against, again, what the wealthy want. Because if we think about other people, maybe we want to do more social reforms. And they really, the wealthy really don't want that. They want people to be very individualistic and selfish because then it's easier, I guess, to defund public um, institutions. And one example is uh, that in like the 40s, 50s, how easy it was and how the, for the middle class to own a house, to, to, to get their children, to, to get an education, because education was state funded, so relatively cheap. And how this changed and all the funds were taken from the state and all the institutions, the educational institutions became more, more or less privatized and the, thus very expensive. So only available for the rich, basically. And um, it's, just, it's just crazy how, how it all comes together in this book, in this very short, short book, which is basically a picture book, right? I highly recommend it. 
if you haven't seen the the movie or you just want to just want to read a concentrated version of the movie i think it's quite an eye opener um so i think i give this like five stars the next book I read is How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibrahim X. Kendi. It is something like a memoir style book where the author uh, goes through his, his evolution and uh, into becoming an anti-racist. So basically he talks about racism as the way I understand it is like this continuum where we have on one end we have... Um, the racist, then we have the assimilationist, and then we have the anti-racist. So he basically says, he's, he's basically kind of saying that he kind of, how his evolution was on this continuum and how he became an anti-racist. And he draws from his past, uh, he draws from his parents' experiences, his experience as a child in school and then throughout university. And then becoming a professor, I guess, and, and writing this book. So in that sense, I think it was really well written. And I really liked the personal experiences and how he puts himself as an example of, of how he learned and how he evolved. And I think from that point of view, it's really well written. It also talks about, about a whole different top, a whole set of topics. And the book is structured in like the, the chapters are like, First of all, starting with definitions, dueling consciousness, power, biology, ethnicity, body, culture, behavior, color, white, class, black, space, gender, sexuality, failure, success, and survival. So I think um, it also talks about racism at the intersection of all of these different topics. And I, in, from that point of view, it's really, really well-rounded, I would say. And it is not the easiest read, uh, for me at least, uh, um, from the point of view of the language used. But I think it's, it's quite an easy one to get through. I love how he points, his own ex points to his own experiences and how he says that it is not enough to be not racist. Because not racist means it's kind of... Like you're not doing anything actively to combat racism. But I also love his view on, um, on assimilationist theories and how, he, how it is so prevalent also uh, within the black community to try to become more white in, in your thinking, in, in, in how you present yourself to the outside world, in, in how you in your aspirations and just just overall and how that also is really can have really negative impacts and how he also moved away from that because it's uh, assimilationist being assimilationist is also kind of pretty racist because you kind of assume that you if you want to assimilate you are not good enough because then you have to we, you have to reach a higher standard to change yourself, to mold yourself into someone's idea of perfect. So I really love the ideas in this book. And I think maybe in the future I will kind of read this again or listen to it again because I think they're really, his ideas are really, really great and he's really straightforward in putting his points and and arguing um arguing his his ideas and the last book i read and this one took me quite a while because it's really really a chunkster it is aftershock a journey into eastern europe's broken dreams by john pfeffer i am from eastern europe so i was interested to have an overview over what happened after the communism fell in 89 and this looks at several countries uh, from eastern europe Europe and kind of looks at different different initiatives, the democratization process, what happened to its people, and why there is an increasing nationalistic movement in Eastern Europe, which is kind of goes against what happened right after the communism fell, because everyone was everyone was voting for democracy and the liberal market and just becoming more westernized and this looks at how the progress everyone expected from eastern europe wasn't happening as fast as everyone wanted them 
to happen. I guess everyone kind of expected Eastern Europe to kind of reach the level of Western Europe within like five years. And um, they weren't really given any tools or they weren't didn't really have a clear strategy in these countries as to what's going to happen. I really like the chapter, the chapter on the Roma and why they are disadvantaged the way they are and the racism against them and how society, how, how they live outside of society basically and how the author says that the Roma in Eastern Europe are at the level the black community was in the US like in the 50s, 60s and kind of marginalized and segregated. I really like that chapter. Overall, I think this was really well written and it's obviously the author knows about this subject and uh, is really familiar with these countries and have and has i guess interviewed a lot of the people who are at the forefront of of this um democratization privatization process and um, he has met these people both after the communism fell in 89 but he went back and kind of tried to interview them again like like in the early 2010s, I would say. So I really enjoyed this. I do think it was a bit too long. It didn't need to be this long. And um, I think overall, I was a bit lost when it kind of jumped from one country to another, also within the same paragraph. So I was like, okay, who are we? Where are we? What's happening? Overall, I gave this four stars and I recommend it if you're interested in... Um, yeah, in Eastern Europe and its politics, its people, and uh, yeah, its um, recent past, I guess. So these are all the books I have read so far in the month of November. And as I said, it's it was a pretty non-fiction heavy month. So I'm really happy I had uh, some fiction books uh, <laughs> sprinkled in between. So let me know what are the books you have uh, recently finished. Are you also reading nonfiction? What is the best nonfiction book you read this year? Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time. Goodbye.